Thank you, Kobe, for this introduction, and thank you, Zoe, for uh, including me in this panel. I'm very, very happy for the opportunity to present uh, this project to you today. So um, this project analyzes from a new uh, antitrust perspective an emerging phenomenon in the US capital markets, and this is the rise of institutional investors' coalitions. Um, the main argument that I make in this paper is that although those uh, investor coalitions usually revolve around corporate governance issues, which are seemingly benign from an antitrust perspective, they are capable of creating competitive distortions in capital markets, which are markets in which institutional investors compete with each other. And to demonstrate this contention, I focus on one particular uh, powerful group of institutional investors that emerged in recent years, and this is the Coalition Against Dual Class Share Structures. And I show that the collective efforts of institutional investors to inhibit the use of dual class shares in initial public offering is capable of creating distortions in the primary market. Just a second. Okay. So as a general background, a dual class share structure consists of uh, two or more classes of common stock that are differentiated in their voting rights. And this share structure essentially allows um, essentially allows uh, the owners of the shares with the superior voting rights to um, retain control of the company even after the company goes public without having to own the majority of its stock. And although dual class stock has been around the US since the 19th century, a relatively small number of companies chose to uh, adopt this structure. However, in recent years, uh, an increasing number of companies, particularly from the technology sector, have uh, created has created share structure that consists of two or more classes of common stock. Uh, companies that you all know of, such as Facebook, Google, Snapchat, LinkedIn, Airbnb, Zoom, and others, um, have uh, a dual class share structure. And the increasing number of uh, companies that went public with a dual class structure has sparked an academic debate about the merits and the drawbacks of this share structure with two very different scholarly views. So on the one hand, we have the red light group uh, that consists of scholars who associate this share structure with governance risks and with management entrenchment and they call to restrict or to the ban or the, at the very least restrict the use of this share structure. On the other hand, um, there is the uh, green light group which consists of scholars who acknowledge the potential benefits of this share structure. Uh, for example, some argue that this share structure isolates managers from the short-term mindset of Wall Street and allows managers to pursue their vision without having to worry about being fired. Uh, there are other scholars who belong to this group who argue that this share structure reduces the relative uh, voting power of public shareholders, including institutional investors, who are very often insufficiently informed. Um, and I'm also tempted to include in the green light group uh, the SEC, the stock exchanges, and some state bar association, because as I will discuss a bit later, those bodies refuse to respond to calls from the institutional investors community uh, to uh, ban the listing or the registration of this share structure um, because they appreciate, they acknowledge the um, importance of this share structure in terms of encouraging innovators to incorporate and later on to access the public market. Um, in terms of the, the empirical studies, so there are a lot of empirical studies on dual class uh, shares and there are studies that support both views. So on the one hand, we have some studies showing that dual class stock tend to have lower stock returns compared to single class stock and higher levels of management entrenchment. And on the other end, there are studies that show that um, the financial performance of, of uh, certain dual class companies is actually uh, better than those of single class companies and that certain types of dual class companies um, actually display better long term shareholder returns. Now, despite the inconclusivity 
of the empirical data and the very different scholarly views, a large group of powerful institutional investors, uh, with the help of their consortium, has recently undertook both individual and collective actions against the dual class structure, essentially arguing that this share structure has no place in the public market. And in that context, it's important to note that most of the collective efforts has been undertaken by those consortium that I mentioned. Those are trade associations that um, focus on coordinating corporate governance initiatives on behalf of the institutional members. Uh, two prominent ones who have also been very involved in the Coalition Against Dual Class is the um, Council of Institutional Investors, the CIA, and the ISG, the Investor Soji Group. And this body, particularly the CIA, has called upon the SEC and the stock exchanges, as I mentioned, to ban the listing of dual class stock. And when those calls, um, when the SEC and the exchange refused to respond to these calls, uh, the CIA and the institutional investors approached index providers, which are private companies whose main clients are the institutional investors themselves, and called them to exclude dual class from leading market indices. And on that front, um, the institutional investor community had much success, and the two largest index providers, the S&P Dow Jones and the FTSE Russell, uh, decided to exclude dual class from their prominent market indices. Um, another initiative that I will mention is the Dual Class Enablers, which is a list published by the CIA that includes the name of what the CIA terms Dual Class Enablers. Those are directors um, who sat on the boards of private companies that went public with a dual class structure. And the goal of this list, and here I quote the CIA, is to sanction those directors by voting against them or withholding support from them at other uh, single class boards on which they sit. And I, I won't mention all of the other initiatives. There are things that are not written here. But one more thing that I will mention is the public letters initiative. The CIA tend to send uh, public letters to companies who plan to launch an IPO with a dual class structure. Uh, those letters are written on behalf and with inducement from the institutional investors themselves. And in those letters, the CIA essentially calls the companies uh, to abandon the share structure or at least to include a sunset provision, which is a charter provision that um, provides for triggers that result in all companies' shares being converted into a single um, uh, voting share class. Um, um, Obviously, the, the, those, ef those efforts will essentially um, send a um, message to the markets and to the issuers that, that the dual class is not a best practice and probably deter companies from going public with the share structure or at least to include a sunset provision uh, in their, their charters. Now, from a corporate law perspective, the coalition against dual class, just like any other investor coalition, uh, seems as a positive phenomenon. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, for many years, investor coalition has been perceived as a solution to a problem rather than a problem in and of itself. And the idea is that uh, cooperation among shareholders uh, can uh, is likely to help mitigate the rational apathy problem that characterizes public shareholders. Uh, and also because those coalitions are often consist of institutional investors who are perceived as sophisticated market players, they are more likely to promote adequate governance standards and, and, and um, reduce managerial agency costs by uh, effectively monitoring management. Um, and I will say that in the context of the, the, in the Coalition Against Dual Class, uh, those scholars who belong to the Green Light Group, while criticizing the efforts of the coalition and more specific, specifically the agenda that the coalition promotes, those scholars did not seem to be troubled by the, the mere existence of the coalition. And somewhat ironically, some scholars who belong to the Red Light Group even called the institutional investors to join forces in order to effectively deter companies from going public with this share structure. Um, in this paper, what I try to do is to challenge the prevailing positive view on investor coalitions by analyzing it from a different 
angle, from an, an enterprise perspective. And I explained that the corporate law analysis of investor coalition overlooks one key factor, and that is the fact that those coalitions are consist of institutional investors who are not only co-owners of companies, but are, only co but are also competitors in capital markets. So in the primary market, those investors compete with each other uh, as competing bidders. Um, they, they compete on share allocation and IPOs. In other markets, they compete on relative performance uh, based on which they are compensated and, and, and evaluated. Um, so, so clearly those things uh, need to be factored. And the concern that I raise is that institutional investors will take advantage of the freedom they currently have to form coalitions uh, in order to create cartels in disguise, disguise in, the, in the capital markets, uh, potentially leading to price distortions and other uh, anti-competitive effects. Now this um, uh, different analysis that is mandated by antitrust law compared to that of corporate law um, presents a certain tension between the goal of corporate law to, to encourage cooperation among shareholders and the goal of antitrust law to frustrate uh, uh, coordination be, uh, among competitors. And the analysis that I offer and apply in the paper in order to, to decide under which, to which lens an investor coalition should be analyzed is the borderline test. So an investor coalition should be analyzed in according to my view in, in the following way. If, an, if the coalition is confined to the boundaries of the firm that it targets, in the sense that it does not affect markets as well, then corporate law is the adequate framework within which to explore this coalition. However, when the coalition also affects market, uh, potentially affecting the, the, com the the, the competition in the markets in which institutional investors compete, then I think that uh, antitrust law is the right uh, analysis that should apply. Now, the coalition against dual class is a classic example of a coalition that emerges at this borderline between firms and market, because at the IPO stage, institutional investors are not even co-owners of companies. They are mere competitors who compete on, on share allocation. And so consistent with this, in cons in consistent with this uh, uh, approach, I analyze the coalition against dual class through an antitrust lens. Um, what I do is first I show that those initiatives that I mentioned earlier meet the definition of a concerted action under antitrust law. Later on I talk about the potential um, uh, market distortions that this coalition is capable of creating. I focus on a lot on the market power of the coalition and the structure of the IPO market in the sense that, first of all, institutional investors um, account for most of the expected market demand for public offerings, and on average, they uh, receive around 90% of the shares sold in IPOs. Also, because the coalition involves the largest and most influential institutional investors, it essentially aggregates their power. And so the power of the coalition is, is really immense. And finally, um, in the context of the market power of the coalition and its ability to affect prices and terms of security sold in IPO, I give uh, importance to the fact that institutional investors in the US are uh, are, they have an important role as providers of valuable pricing feedback during roadshows, during the book building process that ultimately um, dictates the uh, final offer price um, that, uh, in which the uh, uh, shares will be sold in the IPO. And after discussing the market by also talk, the market uh, power of the institutional investors, I talk in the paper about the, the main market effects, and I recognize two main market effects. One of them is the price effect, the ability of the coalition to depress the price of dual class share sold in IPOs, as well as what I term the governance terms effect, which is, in the case of the coalition against dual class, is the control rights that are attached to the, the coalition. And I'll just elaborate more on each one of them. Um, 
As to the price effect in the primary market, I explained in the paper that the coalition creates a mutual understanding among institutional investors that a dual class structure is not a best practice, it's therefore flawed, and uh, a price that a uh, company that chooses to go public with a dual class stru structure should bear a price tag. And this, despite the fact that, as I mentioned, the empirical data does not clearly does not uh, support this uh, completely, and also there are, as I said, different scholarly views on that. But this is the message that the coalition conveys. Um, and in fact, several institutional investors have explicitly and publicly um, mentioned that a decision of a company to go pu to go public with a dual class structure should come with a price tag and the dual class stock should be discounted. Um, uh, I will also um, mention that um, as many legal practitioners and also some scholars um, acknowledge, it is hard to believe that those statements that they, the institutional investors community make publicly are not conveyed to the issuers and the underwriters during the, the book building process and during the what is called the taste the water communication which uh, precedes the, the book building process. So uh, there are clearly a lot of uh, uh, points in the pricing process in which this uh, notion that the dual structure is flawed uh, can be conveyed um, to other market actors. And in the context of the price effect, I will also uh, mention the index exclusion sanction uh, because this sanction in itself is capable of creating uh, price distortion because, as you probably know, index inclusion uh, increases the demand and the liquidity of a stock. So essentially what the coalition is capable of doing is um, um, artificially inflate the penalty imposed on, on dual class issuers, uh, potentially leading to uh, underpricing of dual class stock. And there is one recent study that actually showed that there is significant underpricing of dual class, that the first day bump, bump, this is what the study showed, which is the price increase of the stock in its first day of trading, which is a good indicator for uh, an underpricing, is twice as large for dual class compared to single class. And there are some anecdotal evidence of severe underpricing of dual class companies, companies such as Airbnb and Snapchat, whose decision to go public with the dual class structure received much criticism from the institutional investor community, and yet these companies had very significant um, uh, first day bump, which suggests suggest that these companies left billions of dollars on the table and could have received twice as money for the shares they sold in the IPO. Uh, so this is the price effect. The governance terms effect is reflects the ability of the coalition to affect non-price terms, and in particular, uh, in the context of the coalition, as I mentioned, is the uh, control rights attached. And what I explain in the paper is how the coalition is likely to enhance the control right attached to uh, shares, uh, dual class shares, um, for example, by including the sunset provision that I uh, mentioned. And I'll also say that in the antitrust literature, there is um, um, an acknowledgement that a st standard set selling process is very often uh, uh, um, a process that raises anti-competitive risk because it involves uh, competition among buyers, uh, a coordination between buyers uh, uh, that may result in price distortions and in, in a market exclusion. And what I show in the paper is that the coalition may well be analogized to the standard setting process in the sense that it really affects prices and also is likely to exclude dual class or dual class without a sunset provision from the, the capital markets or from a subset of the capital markets such as uh, market indices. Um, um, so uh, I think uh, I'll manage. I will say that in the antitrust literature, the um, um, the standard setting process, 
that I think this is what institutional investors are trying to do now in the context of voting rights may be seen as a collusive practice regardless of the uh, reasonableness, the reasonableness or the legitimacy of the uh, standard being promoted. So the idea is uh, there is a famous case of the Supreme Court in which the Supreme Court denounced the well-intentioned activities of a trade association that tried to um, eradicate the counterfeit closing market. Um, basically, the Supreme Court acknowledged that those are good intentions, that the standards are good, but he, but the Supreme Court also said that um, um, th those activities are essentially an attempt to become an extra-governmental agency and did not allow it. So using the same rationale, I think that the coalition may ring alarm bells even to those who view the single uh, voting um, rights standard as the adequate one. Um, so also the green, the red light group is, should be troubled by that. Very briefly, I talk about in the paper about the um, um, social welfare implications of the coalition. Most mostly, I focus on the allocational, the distributional implications of it. And in terms of the policy proposal, that's the last one, Kobe. Uh, I suggest to regulate uh, regulate investor coalitions, and in particular those that emerge at the borderline between firms and market. And also, I I suggest. Uh, focusing on investor consortia which are currently on the rise because these investors, as I said, are um, uh, very involved in setting governance standards and I think that they should be uh, viewed for antitrust purposes as standard setting organizations and therefore meet the requirement that antitrust law uh, demands from them. That's it. Thank you for your listening.